Hello everybody, welcome to the True Crime Corner with Tubby. On today's case, we're going to be talking about the murder of Mark James Kilroy. On the 14th of March 1989, University of Texas Austin student Mark James Kilroy was kidnapped in Metamoris, um, Mexico while on spring break, vacationing for spring break. Mark was abducted by his kidnappers and taken to a ranch um, in New Mexico in Metamoros and he was he was tortured for hours and sodomized for hours before he was murdered with a machete to the head. After that his brains were taken out and were boiled not only that um his abductors his killers um decapitated his legs and placed a wire inside his spinal column before he was buried on the ranch with 14 other people that were murdered before him Kidnapped by a cult and the leader of this cult his name was Adolfo Constanzo so Adolfo Constanzo told his followers that if um, that human sacrifices gave them immunity for their drug um, for their drug operations gave them immunity from law enforcement for their drug operations Let's talk about Mark and his background Mark James Kilroy was born on the 5th of March, 1968, in Chicago, Illinois. His parents' names was William Kilroy and Helen Josephine Kilroy. They, they moved to Texas and from the Midwest after their son was born. Mark Kilroy um, grew up in Santa Fe, um, a small town outside of Houston, Texas along with his brother Keith Kilroy um, and they grew up Catholic and they grew up in this town for over 15 years. They grew up Catholic and his parents, they were regular attendees of our Lord's, Our Lady Lord's Catholic Church in Texas. Mark was known to be excellent in his academics and sports. He excelled in sports. He played baseball, basketball, and golf with his friends at school, and he was part of the student council in his high school as well. In academics, he was ranked 14th in a population of students of 210. So that means he was pretty, pretty, pretty smart. He was, yeah, he was a straight A student. Upon graduation, upon graduation in 1986, he, he attended South he attended Southwest University in Texas and he transferred to Stephenville um university state university in Stephenville, Texas on a basketball scholarship. After that he decided to give up his um his athletic career. To, he went to Texas Austin University to become a pre-med student. Okay, now that we know a little bit more about Mark, let's get into the in the, the case and how everything happened. On the 10th of March, 1989, a friend, a childhood friend of Mark's, Bradley Moore, finished his exams early in his university and headed over to Austin, Texas, where he went to go pick um, Mark up. Okay, so I'm still going to be using this Return to Paradise palette from Scarlet Hill. So after Bradley picked up Mark, they headed to Santa Fe where they picked up two of his other friends, Bill Huddleston and Brent Martin before heading for South Padre Island for spring break. Um, they took, it was a nine hour drive to South Padre Island. Um, they reached there before midnight, the Sheraton Hotel before midnight, and they stayed there until the next morning they went to the beach. Not a lot of students headed there already because they became, they got there early, um, but South Padre Island is known in 
United States um, to be a spring break vacation area for students. Um, so over the probably the next day, thousands of students were going to be coming across from like the US for their spring break there. They had like um, beer sponsors, where like events were going to take place. Um, all types of activities were going to take place, you know, like a musical events, modeling contests and so forth. Mark and Bradley on that day made free phone calls to their parents back at home and later on met up with female frame, females from University of Padro, Padro, sorry if I'm, not, if I'm pronouncing this wrong, and they party till the next morning. The reason why the free calls is like important is because this is in 1989 where like, you know, there wasn't like, like calls like cell phones in terms of like, I can just make a call wherever. So probably like had those telephone poles where they made calls. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was back in the day, guys. The following day, Mark and his friends had like a day routine in mind. They went to the beach and got sunbathed and tanned for lunch. And after that, they headed to, um, the back of the hotel where there was like a Miss Tan line contest happening and that's where they went after lunch. After the contest of Miss Tan line was over, Mark headed back to the hotel to go take a nap and also start preparing for their trip to Mexico. After that they left for they left South Padre Island and stopped at a drive in a dinner drive in in Port Isabel and met up with a group of females from the University of Kansas. The females were also planning on partying in Mexico, so they followed um, Bradley's car. Bradley's car to they followed his car to Bronzeville and parked their car near the international oh we got this is not i don't know what's happening here what am i doing oh girl i think i should have let this dry first uh -huh. uh, what's happening here so the bronze let me just deal with my eyes so that I can see what's happening. Um, they parked their car at Brownsville International Bridge where they parked their cars and went over the border by foot. So they crossed the Mexican border, the US Mexican border. So Mark and his friends spent most of the night in Sergeant, Sergeant um, Pepper's club in Matamor Matamoros, Matamoros, Mexico. And they spent the night, they partied till like the next morning until both groups went their separate ways. Um, Mark, Mark and his friends went back to South Padre, so they went back to the US. So basically, they were like in the U.S. going into Mexico, in the U.S. going back into Mexico. The next day, on the 13th of March, Mark and his friends attended uh, another Miss Tan Line contest. Early in the evening, around early in the evening, around 10:30 p.m. Um, after the Miss Kansas contest, Mark uh, met up with one of his former frat brothers for a at a condo party and that was around 10 p.m after the condo party they went back to the gateway international bridge that um by the u.s mexico border and they parked their cars and went to matamoras jumped into matamoras again like back into mexico so this night, the like this day, this night, it was full of students. There was over like 1,500, that means like 15,000 students 
were in Matamoros. So it was flooded in Matamoros. So when they got there, they decided to go to a club with the shortest line. And that was Los Sombreros. They went to Los Sombreros and they stayed over there for a few drinks. And later on, they went to Hard Rock Cafe. So Mark went to the bar and started chatting to some women. And some were from the, um, the Thames 10 line contest. And he was not seen by his friends until around 2 a.m. in the morning. So Bill, Bill Huddleston, um, Mark's friend, suggested that they head back to South Padre Island. So they need to cross back over the border again. And as they were heading out of the club, they say that they saw Mark leaning up, leaning on a car and talking to one of the Miss Tanline contestants, so one of the females. Um, yeah, one of the female can cross Alvora Street. Thousands of tourists and students were heading to Bronzeville to cross to the Gateway Bridge to cross into South Padre. So the large crowd was making it very difficult for Mark and his friends, obviously, to head back um, in a single form and group. So they decided to go in twos. Okay, so Bradley and Brent went together first and they headed to a restaurant, a popular restaurant near the border. And Bill, Bill and Mark went behind them. But on the way, um, Bill needed needed to pee and he stopped in one of the alleyways and peed. So after he came back from peeing, um, Bill couldn't find um, Mark where he was standing. Um, so he had moved, he, had, he was gone. So Bill didn't think much of it. So he went on ahead and joined the other two, Bradley and Bradley and Brent and thought that maybe um, Mark was with with them and when he got there he was nowhere to be found so the group was still not that concerning like maybe um, he was waiting for them back at the car or like he already went back and jumped the border to South Padre so they went back um, and thought that maybe he was with one of those Miss Handline girls but they went back and he was not there. So without thinking much of it, they went back to South Padre Island and thought that maybe Mark was with um, the, one of the females from the Miss Tanland contest or was it the female that they saw him talking to when he was leaning on the car. So I didn't think much of it because that's what people do on spring break. They hook up, they get drunk, you know, and then you see them the next day. So they were like, okay, let's just wait for him. Maybe he'll come back in the morning. So the next morning, there was still no sign of Mark. And that's when their friends started to become concerned because that was unlike Mark. Even if he um, hooked up with somebody, he would still show up or, you know, because he's responsible. Um, so they they started becoming worried. Um, they started become they started to become worried. I mean, so that's when they contacted. It was on a Tuesday. They contacted Mark's parents um, back in Texas, and they told they told them that um, they can't seem to find Mark anywhere. So that was that scared their parents because, the, like his friends, his parents knew that that is something Mark would not just do. It is unlike him. So they reported this case to the to the Mexican police, and it wasn't it wasn't a case an emergency case because it's still spring break. You know how students disappear and pop up back again. Maybe they were like drunk or like you know. Um, they'll show up again and plus there weren't many telephones so i'm sure they couldn't get contact yeah they couldn't get contact of mark vela so that's when um they yeah so they just waited for it for a while 
but when the news hit Mark's uncle Ken Kilroy, that's when uh, momentum started to to catch on that Mark is really he's been missing and he got a task force in Brownsville to help out with the case um I don't know if I should what should I do with my eyes mm. so when the Mexican police started to notice that this is a serious missing pay, uh, missing person's case um they tried to shift the blame and say that mark did not go missing in matamoros but in bronzeville um in so across the border in the united states but um mark's friends denied those claims because yeah they were very false so they also got a hypnotist to come in and help out with the investigation so they helped out with an investigation for like some clues that were missed you know so during the hypnotist sessions um one of mark's friends recalled um bill bill hiddleston recalled that um that before he went on to to go relieve himself and he um he noticed that mark was approached by a hispanic man and said these words don't i know you from somewhere but mark wasn't um but bill wasn't sure that if mark responded or not this is actually so cool So yeah, so they were not finding any breaks on the case and leads. So um, Mark's parents flew down um, and came and raised five thousand dollars, and the community also helped raise um, another fifteen thousand dollars by yard sales and whatever that they did to help raise the money to come and assist with the search for mark with the search for mark and they raised fifteen thousand dollars for reward money for in for anybody who knows where the whereabouts of mark is so the case grew and grew and mark's parents came down and handed out over two twenty thousand flyers um around the area so the marshals also suspected that Mark's disappearance could have involved um, a drug kidnapping or robbery or like involved drugs or robbery. But Mark's friends and his parents knew that, you know, Mark was not into drugs. Um, yes, he was drinking and but drugs was not his thing. So and they couldn't find any leads onto that type of speculation they also headed over to hospitals with mark's pictures to see if they could find anything any type of lead on the 26th of march um this case was where's my foundation oh, sorry. on the 26th of march this case was broadcasted on america's uh, most wanted so it that's when it started getting a lot a lot of attention and a lot of people started to call in with leads and speculations and saying they saw mark here and all of that you know but they were all dead ends you know you know what people might do for ransom money they'll just start um oh i need new foundation the the leads were solid and yeah Ooh, this is so sad. This foundation story is so sad. What a sad story. Okay. So there's no break until in the investigation until the 1st of April when Mexican federals were doing a regular drug federal, uh, what is it, border control thingy. I don't know what they call it, stops or whatever. And they saw a van that ran across the... That ran, that ran across the roadblock without stopping. So they did not chase this car with um, normal 
police vehicles instead they used private vehicles and followed the car so this car went to ranch and the police just stayed um um without breaking their cover and just looked at the at the environment of the ranch and they noticed that they know this ranch this is that the person who came out of the truck was somebody that they knew and his name was Serafin Hernandez so without arresting Serafin Hernandez for not stopping at the roadblock they left him because they knew that he is a nef he's the nephew of a local drug lord and 9th of april the police came back and arrested hernandez garcia okay like i'm gonna read these names because i don't want to mispronounce them so the police arrested hernandez garcia his uncle elio Hernan hernandez rivera cult members david serena valdez and sergio martinez salinas and doma domingo reyes bastamante bastamante and that's the ranch caretakers so they they all seemed pretty pretty relaxed and um they questioned the caretaker and he is the one that identified Kilroy in the pictures that he was shown that yes they saw he saw this guy being brought in um but he noticed he was in the back of a van in the back of a car in the back of a van I mean sorry and he was they didn't understand each other so he couldn't help him much um because the language barrier but the caretaker said that he went on the next day and gave him some bread and eggs and water to eat and that was the last they saw of him but then he also pointed to um a cabin a cabin on the ranch and pointed to it when they talked about Mark. And when the police interrogated um Garcia Hernandez Garcia, he confessed that over the past several men, several months, um, Mark Kilroy was amongst the people that were killed on the ranch. Okay, so my lighting has changed because of the rain, but we move. Um, so on the 11th of April, the police, the police took Hernandez Garcia. I can't say his name. The police took Hernandez and four other suspects um, to the ranch and forced them at gunpoint to exhume the bodies and show them where they buried the bodies. Um, like I mentioned earlier, that they put wires in like the spinal column, in the spinal columns of like their victims, so that it's easier for them to exhume the bodies. And they exhumed their bodies because when, um, after a while, they take these bodies. Sorry, my skin is shedding, so I know a lot is happening. They exhume these bodies and wear their, their bones as necklaces as a way of protection as well. Um, after they exhumed the bodies, the police noticed that all of the victims had no, um, no legs and hernandez stated that um the remove the removing of the legs was not um is not part of the, the the human sacrifice it's just easier for them to bury the victims it just makes for easier burial and they got um they exhumed 15 bodies that including mark kilroy's and they identified Mark Kilroy with his dental, um, his dental remains, that it is him. Okay, so let's go back and know a little bit more of our cult leader, Alfandro Constanzo. Let's, let's, let's try and get to know this man. Um, so Adolfo Constanzo was a cuban-american he's cuban-american and was born 
in Miami, Florida. This one work. I don't know. In 1962. Ooh, this blush. I hope it works, but I feel like. Okay, I'm trying to give blossom. Okay, so um, Alfonso Constanzo's dad passed away when he was an infant, and his mother relocated. His mother relocated with him um, to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like this blush. It's not too much. Um, they stayed in Puerto Rico for a while, and in 1972, they returned to Florida, where his mom remarried. Um, his stepfather soon died thereafter, leaving them with um, a, with a big inheritance. So, after his stepfather died, his stepfather, first stepfather died, um, his mother then remarried again to a um, man who was involved in drug trafficking and an occult and his stepfather is the one so his second stepfather is the one who taught him all her like all this philosophy that he's going to now he carried on into his adult life he told him that um non-believers should die from taking their drugs from taking drugs and he should profit off of that. It was around this time where Alfonso's mom believed that Alfando, Ald, Ald, Alfando had um, psychic abilities and introduced her, introduced him to a uh, priest who believed in Palo Mayombe, which is an uh, Afro-Caribbean religion that involves human sacrifices. I mean, not human sacrifices, animal sacrifice. Started to practice um, Palo, Palo Mayambe, and eventually he became a high priest in this religion. In 1984, he moved to Mexico City and started his career as a tarot card reader. And that's when he started to gain a following, um, a following. And it was easy for him because he was once um um because of his attractiveness and physical features because he was once a model okay let me just try this okay and so is sarah alderte sarah alderte comes into the picture as she was a girlfriend to Gilberto Salsa and who was linked to the Hernandez clan which Adolfo Constanzo wanted an introduction Sarah and that's in 1987 that's when Adolfo met Sarah and after that Sarah became the cult's main recruiter so investigators believe that this worked because of Sarah's physical appearance she was very good looking so she lured in men uh, and young boys into the cult um, so that's what they believed and Sarah was described by her classmates that she she was very down to earth she kept to herself and yeah but they did realize that she wore black most of the time and that Sorry, I'm just doing this out of me. And that she had a car that had a telephone inside. Which was back then was a big deal because those cars were very expensive. Go back to how they were caught on the 11th of April, the same day that the bodies were exhumed. Um, Alfondo Constanza. Okay, let me try this. I don't know if it's going to work. of April, Alfredo Constanzo escaped with Sarah to Mexico City, where he had an apartment. 
17th of April, Mexico City police raided one of Alfonso Constanza's apartments and in the apartment they found homosexual pornography and altars. And his apartment was filled with like was filled with blood, like there's blood splatters all over. In the in that apartment police found um Sara Aldrete's purse and that led police to, to the conclusion that he might have killed her because she probably knew too much. On the 6th of May, 1989, police surrounded one of the apartments that, um, an apartment that was led to know that um, Hernandez was in there. I mean, Constanza was in there. I don't know if I should wear these earrings or not. Um, but before police could raid, um, I feel like this is too much. No, nope. before police could raid the apartment, Alfado already noticed the police downstairs, and he fired. Um, he started shooting at them before they were able to raid the apartment. Um, he lit out. He threw out some money, and he also burned some cash um, on the stove before they came in. He forced one of his cult followers to kill him, to shoot him, because he said that nobody, um, he's not going to go to hell and he's not going to go to prison. So it's basically one of those things of like, um, I'd rather die for my cause than go to prison. So, well, the name of the person who shot um, Constanza was De Leon, and he later on confessed that he was going crazy. Um, saying nobody's gonna have my money and nobody's gonna take me to prison. On August 1990, De Leon was sentenced to 30 years for the killing of Adolfo Constanzo. So, Sara Aldeltre, um, Aldeltre was sentenced to 40 years in prison. But this is what she had to say. I'm going to read to you guys what Sarah Aldrete said and in her claim of innocence. Aldrete spoke to the press in 2003 and denied her participation in Kilroy's murder and the cult killings. She stated that it was impossible for investigators to understand what had happened at Santa Elna because the biggest evidence in the case, Constanza, was dead. Aldrete Alderte also stated that the police hid names of famous people involved with Constanza for their own convenience. She concluded by stating that she believed in God and was not going to ask society for forgiveness because she was innocent of the crimes. The following year, Alderte interviewed with the press again and stated that she had been tortured, tortured to confess she said that she had been stripped naked, blindfolded, beaten upside down, and then had her toenails yanked. Alderte, Alderte claimed she was beaten so severely that doctors told her she would never be able to have children. In the early 2000s, she published an autobiography where she detailed how she met Constanza and the group. Her ex experiences when she was allegedly taken hostage by Constanza, her mistreatment by authorities, and her versions of the story. Aldelta claimed she visited Constanza in Mexico City and was taken hostage after Constanza decided to not let her go because he believed that she would go to the police and tell them where they were hiding. She claimed that Constanza and the rest of the group were unaware of the killings that occurred in Matamoros until they were found out that the police were looking for them, but went into hiding nonetheless because they feared for their lives. She details her alleged mistreatment in jail and how she underwent beating, psychological torture, rape, and unfair trial. Her version of the Constanza's death was different than the official one. She stated that Constanza was executed by the police when they raided the apartment. She also questions, questioned the police decision to burn down the shack in Santa Elna, since it was a crucial for the investigation and probably contained fingerprints of the murders. Okay, so let me explain that. Um, when they went to exhume the bodies in Santa Elna on the ranch, um, because 
Mexican rituals or like rituals like these are very people fear them um so even the Mexican officials could not go into the cabin that was on the ranch only the U.S. marshals went in there but after that they after they took out the things that were in the in the in the ranch they burnt it down um and the things that were there was like a whole big drum that had like brains human brains um chicken bones that they burned for their ritual sacrifices um so she says that it's very suspect for police officials to burn down a place that could have that could have potential evidence in solving the case i mean she does have a good point but you know who knows okay so till this day we do not know if um sara alderte is innocent or not or whether she was involved in the cult killings or in malk kilroy's murder um so prior off so i think this i still need a little bit of mascara Okay, so two months after Kilroy was confirmed dead, his parents founded the Mark Kilroy Foundation, which promotes drug awareness, education, and prevention through the Just Say No campaign. Since Kilroy's death, uh, since Kilroy's dream was to become a doctor after college, his parents decided to help others continue his dream through his program. Since 1994, the foundation has sponsored and worked alongside substance abuse free environment, SAFE, a nonprofit community group that promotes awareness of substance abuse and drug prevention. Both of them partner with Santa Fe local government, its school system, and the ones nearby with the business and private donors to provide programs for the entire year. The full-time and part-time counselors visit school campuses during the academic year. According to Kilroy's father, the purpose of these summer activities is to keep the youth occupied when they are not in school so they do not get bored and think about consuming drugs. In September 1999, the foundation signed an agreement with the U.S. federal government to receive 10 yearly grants of $100,000 by the 10th year, the government intended to stop the funding and expect the foundation to be self-supporting. However, Kilroy's parents stated that the yearly expenses exceeded $160,000 and that they would need to find new ways to make up the deficit. The, the Mark Kilroy Foundation was one of the five nonprofit organizations in Galveston County that receives proceeds from a bingo place in Ma Marquis, Texas. Why did I say that name? <laughs> La Marquis, Texas. They also receive proceeds from sales of books, the book Sacrifice, written by Kilroy's father and Bob Stewart in 1990. So, okay, I don't know if I should add some more information, Um, but okay, let me just add it. Okay, after Kilroy was confirmed dead, the media framed the drug group and their religious practices as, satan as Satanists. Okay. And after the after Kilroy was confirmed dead, the media framed the drug group and their religious practices as Satanist. For the most part, the U.S. media labeled the group as Satanist and gave little mention to the drug-related violence that was widespread in northern Mexico, thus failing to provide a wider picture of what happened at Matamoros. Reports concluded that because human body parts were found inside a large metal pot, the group practiced cannibalism. Some journalists made the error of attributing cannibalism with the common mistake of Satanist groups sacrificing and eating human remains. On the 12th anniversary of their son's murder, Kilroy's parents visited the Rio Grande Valley and Matamoros to thank the people who had supported them in the search for their son. Kilroy's father stated that people were supportive and called the police whenever they saw something suspicious and they thought was related to their son's disappearance. He said that it was easier to overcome their son's death because of the support that was received. Kilroy's mother says she received a cross from a Brownsville woman when she was searching for her son in 1989. It's a reminder. 
quotation, this is what Kilroy's mom said. It's a reminder every time that I know that the Lord was involved in everything. She said, while she touched and showed the cross around her neck. Helen Kilroy died in 2014 from ALS aged 70. This is a very heartbreaking story and um oh why like cults are just so hi guys anyway that was my case for the week i hope you guys enjoyed it and i am blossom i think i didn't mention this i am blossom my previous case i was bubbles so i am blossom in this case hence the pink and hence the <laughs> The pink lips, the pink shirt, the pink and orange shirt. Um, but I hope that you guys enjoyed this case. Catch you on the next video.